edit, just be, be sure to sign in in the back of the room. Today we're going to have two speakers. The second one has not arrived yet, uh, but he will fill in as we get going, so uh, we don't want to delay. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Don Bauer. He's the second speaker. He's a partner at the law firm of Perkins Coie, and he practices law focused on ocean and coastal issues, energy resources, marine resources. Um, he represents clients in offshore renewables development and oil and gas development, among other things. And he has been teaching in our summer program for 19 years. He teaches ocean and coastal law, which is a wildly popular course here in the summer. So many of you are probably in his class. He serves on the boards of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, the Shenandoah National Park Trust, and the Environmental Leadership Council of the Environmental Law Institute. And lastly, he has a BA degree with highest honors from Trinity College and a law degree from University of Pennsylvania. To my left uh, is our speaker who's going to uh, get us started today, and that's Dr. Heather Rally. She's a veterinarian for PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals Foundation. She has specific training in marine mammal medicine and actively works in the fields of ocean conservation and animal welfare. Her background's in aquatic animal and ocean ecosystem health with a focus on marine mammal rescue and rehabilitation. And over the past seven years, Dr. Rally has worked alongside Oceanic Preservation Society to document and expose environmental crimes and environmental welfare violations on multiple continents. She's done undercover investigations and worked on documentary films that have helped to expose and put an end to the illegal sale of endangered species. And she's brought global attention to the exponential rate of extinction that's happening throughout the planet today. In her current position with the PETA Foundation, she uses her veterinarian expertise to expose abuse and neglect in roadside zoos and circuses. She coordinates rescues of abused animals, persuades businesses to adopt animal-friendly policies and pushes authorities to enforce local, state, and federal captive animals. She holds a BS from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a DMV from the Western University of Health Sciences. Today, she's going to start us off by presenting lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, <laughs> the captive wildlife crisis in our backyard. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rally. Thank you all for sacrificing your lunch time to be here. Um, and to Don Bauer and to DLS staff for making it possible for me to be here. Um, so in all of that, <laughs> the latter portion is what I'm gonna discuss with you today. Um, it's predominantly revolving around the work that I do with the PETA Foundation. Um, even though I am a veterinarian, I feel like this forum is a, um, particularly applicable to the work that I do. And that's reflected in the fact that I actually work with lawyers. I work with a team of lawyers housed within PETA's legal department. Um, and our team is quite small. Uh, my boss is a lawyer. And we have several lawyers on staff in our department full time, myself, another veterinarian, and a couple of captive wildlife specialists. And we focus exclusively on captive wildlife issues um, and cases of abuse and neglect um, in typically roadside zoos and circuses, as well as in private ownership. So um, today I'm hoping to give you an idea of what that means when I talk about the captive wildlife crisis um, and then all, all of the sort of a holistic view of the, all of the angles that we take, all of the work that we do to help secure protection for these animals. Um, so what do I mean when I say captive wildlife crisis? So I'm specifically referring to animals used in, in entertainment or held as pets. We have a completely different department that deals with laboratory animal welfare, wh of which um, there are a number of species that overlap, um, particularly primates, of course. But I deal with largely, I mean, this is an example of a variety of species, largely big cats, lions, tigers, uh, bears, primates, and elephants. In private menageries, backyard breeders, yes, we do have backyard breeders of tigers in this country, similar to puppy mills for dogs, and we'll talk a bit about that later. 
Um, and then roadside zoos and pseudo sanctuaries, there's no regulation over that term sanctuary. So um, anyone can call themselves a sanctuary. And of course there are a handful of very good sanctuaries in this country, but that's only a handful. Um, circuses and traveling exhibitions. So these are situations that are inherently because of the constraints of what these people do with these animals are inherently um, subpar for, in terms of being able to provide for those animals basic needs. So with respect to tigers, today I'm gonna talk to you largely about tigers and bears, and that's because as far as this crisis goes, um, and in looking at the sheer number of animals uh, representative of this crisis, lions uh, or tigers and bears are the, what I spend most of my time on, um, the largest populations. And the reason for this, for tigers in particular, is that um, we have a whole industry that thrives on pumping out tiger cubs. So that's why we have actually an overpopulation crisis and most people are really surprised to learn that we have more tigers in American backyards than exist in the wild. Vastly, vastly more. Um, so across all of Asia and Russia where all subspe subspecies of tigers roam, we estimate there are about just over 3,000 uh, tigers left in the wild. In American backyards, we have at least an estimated five to 7,000 tigers, and these are not in public, these are completely excluding what you think of as a zoo. So most people think of a zoo as your city zoo, and uh, most city zoos are AZA accredited, meaning they have met higher standards um, of care and husbandry for their animals. So excluding those, just in backyards, roadside zoos, and in circuses, we have about five to 7,000. If you include lions and other endangered big cats in that category, it goes up to about 10,000 animals. Um, so of course, I mentioned, we have an industry that exploits cubs, and this is why we have an overpopulation problem. This is called the cub petting industry. They, these regulators, um, so these people are regulated under the Federal Animal Welfare Act, and within those guidelines, there's sort of a, a vague, Thing that these facilities um, interpret as meaning it is okay for them to, legally okay, for them to engage these cubs with direct contact with the public between the ages of eight to 12 weeks of age. Um, and of course, they're exploited for much longer periods, every, anywhere from a couple of weeks of age where they're prematurely pulled from their mothers intentionally to be used in these programs up until about six months when they become incredibly dangerous and that's because it's very hard for regulators to go in there and determine the age of, it, of cubs so they end up getting exploited for a much longer period of time. And they do everything from cub petting and photo ops to bottle feeding to even swimming with tigers. This is a facility in Florida. Um, so what happens? Of course, at six months of age, when these animals are no longer uh, useful to the industry, they need to continue bringing in, the, they need to bring in the next pair and push the other ones out. And of course, that creates a massive population of surplus of animals. Um, where those animals go is, is uh, there's a wide variety of situations. They might go into a circus, they might go into another facility, they might go to private ownership um, in states where that's legal, and we'll discuss a bit about that. Um, these are the types of situations being walked around town on a leash, um, carted around the country in dog crates, dog kennels, um, and living life like this in overcrowded conditions. Um, so this, of course, is combustible, and many of you are probably wondering how it's possible that this goes on, and not a lot of people know about it, and it hasn't imploded. Well, it has in a few cases. Um, I don't, how many of you have heard of the Zanesville Massacre? Oh, nice. Um, yeah, so this was an incident in 2011, not that long ago, in Ohio. This was a once, this was a then legal menagerie, private menagerie. This person did not exhibit these animals, it was just his private collection. This was perfectly legal at the time in Ohio without permitting. There were zero laws um, regulating this practice. He went over the deep end one day and unleashed all of his animals on the town and shot himself. Um, of course, that became a huge public safety issue, and the officers in this town were, uh, they shot to kill all of these animals on site um, because they had to, at that stage you have no choice. They leveled the whole lot, almost 50 animals, um, 18 Bengal tigers, 17 African lions, at least six black bears, a few grizzlies, a few wolves, a few baboon, uh, you name it, cougars, he had everything. Um, so this was a, a huge tragedy and it made massive headlines. Um, not just in Ohio, but nationally, of course, it was a wake up call for Ohio and for the entire country. 
Um, and now, fortunately, of course, it's reactive, and it takes something like this oftentimes for us to change regulations, but Ohio has um, instituted the Dangerous Wild Animal Act um, just actually one year after this in 2012. So they've now made it illegal to have many of these animals, dangerous wild animals. But then there was a grant, they were able to grandfather in some of the people who already had these animals if they were abiding by you know, more stringent uh, caging requirements and things like that. But this is what the map looks like um, in the US. It's, um, this, this practice is governed by state laws. Um, and this is actually outdated as of a few weeks ago. South Carolina has just joined um, all the rest of the blue, the sea of blue, fortunately. So now we only have four states where this is un completely unregulated, meaning you can go online and buy a tiger for less than you would pay for a purebred dog. In some cases, yes, that's true, like $300. Um, and you can keep that tiger in your living room or in your backyard and no one will ever need to know and you don't need to have a permit. So these are shelter states. This is incredibly problematic, of course, for obvious reasons. So we're, um, there are many groups out there that are working to change this. Um, and unfortunately, in Alabama, North Carolina, Wisconsin, and Nevada, um, that hasn't quite happened yet. But um, <laughs> so you would think, great, okay, only four states to go. Um, and that's, it's, it, of course, it's important for us to be doing that, to be instituting those laws. But there are a lot of shortcomings of those laws that um, certainly because a state outlaws um, keeping of private the private ownership of dangerous exotic animals doesn't mean that we're protecting animals adequately. And in fact, um, oftentimes these animals get into situations as long as, so in those states, as long as you have a permit to operate commercially as a sanctuary or as a re rescue or rehab facility, you can still, you can, it's business as usual. You can still operate just the same way. Um, so obviously this is still going on even in the states that have the best of laws. And then of course you have a problem of enforcement. Um, and this is because a lot of times local, the jurisdiction over these facilities locally with respect to animal cruelty laws, um, that falls on local animal control officers. It falls on um, potentially police. It varies by jurisdiction, by locality and by state, who is in charge of that. But of course, uh, most local animal control officers don't know anything about tigers and don't want to go near them. So um, you have situations where uh, it's, a, it's really largely hands off. And these facilities, of course, people who don't have that expertise to go in and enforce any law um, when they don't have the education to back that up, they're really disempowered um, because these owners are very, very quick to remind them that they are not the experts, right? Uh, so, so unfortunately, we have problems that arise. And so if you look at this map, you can see California is one of those states that has banned private ownership of dangerous exotics. They've had one of the longest standing bans, and we also have some of the best animal protection laws. And yet, horrendous cases of cruelty continue to happen in states like this. This is one extreme um, example of that. And this was in Colton, California. This was in 2003. This person, his name was John Weiner. He was operating a sanctuary called the Tiger Rescue Sanctuary in California. And I don't know, I don't recall the circumstances around how it was reported to police, but when police arrived, they found 90 dead tigers on his property, including 58 cubs who'd been shoved into freezers. And um, then on the sort of front part of the property, there was an enclosed gated area. And when he went in there, he found um, 30 dead decaying carcasses of tigers, various stages of decay. Many of them had been roped. You, can, you can't, it's hard to see, but this tiger has been roped by the front paws, um, tied to discarded auto parts, presumably left to starve to death. And there were a number of tigers who were starving, malnourished on the property, um, a couple of tigers wandering around his porch, starving adult tigers, some cubs in the attic, um, all sorts of horrendous things going on. And this is in one of the best states with some of the best laws, right? So fortunately, this was the biggest tiger rescue that's ever taken place. Um, and there are a number of groups that came together to rescue 39 of these tigers, and they now live like this fortunately, with exceptional veterinary care at the Performing Animal Welfare Society, PAWS Sanctuary up in Northern California. Um, so now they have uh, you know, exceptional nutrition, et cetera. But this is a case of extreme, extreme failure, right, on the part of the existing establishment, the existing laws. Um, and how can this be happening? So how can we not only address issues like this directly, but prevent them from happening? How do we get at the root 
cause of all of this. Um, and that, is, that really takes evolving um, the whole industry, educating from everyone from regulators to local law enforcement to um, the facilities themselves. Um, and we do have some amazing um, things happening in captive animal welfare, health, and husbandry in this country. Unfortunately, it's not really trickling down. <laughs> so one of the things that we use is the Animal Welfare Act. So we've already talked about state laws. There are also local laws that govern some of this. But the one overarching umbrella law is the Animal Welfare Act. And that applies, so this is, I pulled out this Congressional Statement of Policy um, and highlighted this portion because it's, it just shows how broad this is, right? So there's one set of legislation literally to cover all species, well, not all species. Um, that is if you don't consider birds a species or mice or rats or reptiles, but for the most part, any animal that's in human care um, is governed by this law. And so that's research facilities, exhibition purposes, and use as pets, and that all of them are provided humane care and treatment. So that sounds fine and dandy, right? Um, well, what's the reality? How does this play out? So we have USDA licensed facilities. U the US, US Department of Agriculture is the federal agency that's tasked with enforcing the Animal Welfare Act. And that's in every, every area of animal husbandry, from your dairy farm to your zoo. Right, so they, they, they license everything. And you have to have a license with respect to wildlife, you have to have a license if you are exhibiting the animal. So you don't, they don't have jurisdiction over animals held as individual pets. Um, when, the, when it says pets in the Animal Welfare Act, it's really referring to the dealers and the people, so they, they, you do have to be regulated if you're selling animals as pets and things of that nature. But once you decide you want your tiger to be in the backyard in a cage and you want to open your doors and you want people to come see your tiger, then you have to have a USDA license. Um, so we have about 2,800 USDA licensed facilities in this country just exhibiting captive, dangerous captive wildlife. Um, and only 250 of those facilities are AZA accredited, meaning your city zoos, um, your things we think of as typical zoos. And that's less than 10%. So um, a lot of these facilities, we, we, we have to overcome this um, perception that having a USDA license means that it's a good situation for the animals. Um, what a USDA license actually means is that you've paid your dues, you've submitted your application, and they've given you a stamp. Um, now, when you're oper while operating under that license, you do have to be inspected by USDA inspectors. Typically, it happens once a year um, or every other year at random and you are supposed to be inspected for compliance with the Animal Welfare Act. So in theory, that sounds fine, right? Um, but when a facility is not compliant with the Animal Welfare Act, they receive a citation. So the problem is we have a big disconnect between licensing, um, the actual facilities being licensed, and actual compliance with the law here. Um, so for example, this is a facility that's still operating business as usual in Michigan. It's called Summer Wind Farms Sanctuary, once again. Be very careful when you want to go, if you want to go to a sanctuary that you're actually going to one. This facility had over 200 citations in just the past three years alone, and they are still operating business as usual. And the public would never know about this unless, there were organi unless protection organizations like ours are out there going and getting these inspection reports from the government, publicizing the fact that they're breaking the law. Um, because they have to be licensed every year, so, or they have to renew their license every year. So the government, they have to pay their fees, they have to submit the application, they have to be renewed, and the government does that every year. Um, so for three years in a row, they've been chronically not um, abiding by the law, and yet they've been licensed over and over again. So we think that's illegal, for one thing. Um, we've actually sued the USDA over this practice, over this policy of rubber stamping licenses. <laughs> because of course we believe that an applicant cannot simultaneously be violating the Animal Welfare Act and also being compliant with it. So we think that's incompatible and that that is illegal. That's still pending and ongoing right now, but it's an incredibly frustrating um, thing that goes on pretty rampantly. This is a, there are a number of facilities. That one that I just mentioned is actually not mentioned in the lawsuit, but this is a facility out in I believe in Maryland, yeah, Maryland, called Tri-State, and they were mentioned. They're one of our just chronic violators of the law who is still operating. Um, so the other problem that we have, that's one of the big, big problems that we have with the Animal Welfare Act, 
uh, enforcement. And the other problem is sort of one of interpretation. Um, how do we adequately protect all of these animals who are, who are um, protected under, technically protected under this law, but it's the same language, right? It's just this generic statement about needing to provide for the humane care and treatment of all of these animals. Of course, that's not equivalent from animal to animal, right? So when we say, um, when you're applying these statutes to, to these animals from the Animal Welfare Act, you're applying the same sentence to a bat, to, as, a, as to a tiger, as to an elephant, and those animals need very, very different things, right? Um, not to mention the actual minimum stand, they're minimum standards, so the standards themselves are also inadequate. Um, but there is enough uh, sort of loose language in the Animal Welfare Act that we actually can, we can prove based on current science, based on um, new discoveries on you know, animal illnesses that occur because of certain husbandry practices, everything we learn about keeping these animals in captivity or about their natural history can be applied to enforcing this act better. Um, so that's one of the things that we, we try to do. I'll explain how we do that, but I put this slide up here because I think the average person might think that all of these animals are smiling, right? But a smile is not a smile is not a smile, of course. Um, this bear probably is smiling. They actually do smile. They're my favorite. Um, <laughs> this guy is probably smelled something really interesting. That's a Fleming response. He's opening his olfactory channel, canal to like um, smell that, that smell better. Um, this is just that small sloth's normal face. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm not a sloth expert, but um, point being, all of these animals have been perfectly sculpted over millennia through the processes of natural selection to fulfill a very specific niche within their natural habitat. And they are all different, and they all have genetically ingrained behavioral needs that allow them to, to fulfill that, not only to survive, but to thrive in that role. And so when we take that animal out of, it, of his or her natural environment and we put them in a cage, um, not only do we not learn a lot about them, so this is why we're so behind the times, you can't learn a lot from an animal, about who an animal is from keeping them in captivity, but you can by looking at their natural history, um, but you also deprive them of the ability to engage in those basic behavioral needs. And the result of that is psychological suffering and physical illness. Um, so let's take the case of bears as an example. I um, want to also clarify that when I, what, what I mean when I say good welfare. Good welfare means that these animals have a good quality of life from the perspective of the animal. So we are constantly, and that's very hard to do, of course, because you're not in the animal's head, but we are constantly striving to understand what that is. What do these animals need? How do they see the world? Um, all of advances in science and our understanding of those basic things can help us provide better for them in this situation. Um, so in the case of bears, we had an amazing bear husbandry expert. Her name was um, Elsa Poulsen. She's done incredible things for bears. We lost her, sadly, last year to breast cancer. Um, but when she, she approached every animal as an individual, and when she tries to provide for an animal in a captive setting, she always asks, who are you and what can I do for you? So in the case of bears, and of course, this is a generalization, every individual animal is also different, but with respect to bears, looking at their natural history, what do we know about them, about what they need? One of the things we know is that bears are foragers. Um, almost all bears are foragers. They have a really wide range uh, over which they will forage, and they use this incredible nose. I would make an argument. Um, earlier this week, we talked about whales and dolphins and how their hearing is their primary sense. Um, for bears, I would argue that their nose is their primary sense. I mean, a brown bear in particular, we've actually, sh we've actually seen that brown bears will travel in a straight line for 18 miles directly to a food source. For polar bears, that's 40 miles directly to a food source. Um, so think about the implications of this for taking them out of that environment, putting them in a cage, right? Where they don't have the ability to do something like that. They also need to den. All bears, even if they don't hibernate and they're in warmer climates, they will all den. Uh, they need to climb, they need to be able to dig and forage around, and swimming. You will never meet a happier animal than a bear in the water, like love water. So to deprive them of that is what are the psychological consequences, right? So what is the reality for bears? Um, we've done our own survey, and this is obviously not excluding, this is, is excluding private ownership, so this is only bears in USDA licensed facilities in sub -poor, subpar conditions, poor conditions. 
So there are over 1,000 in about 300 facilities. And what does that look like? Well, this is one example, um, a pretty bad one. This was Lily. We found her last year. She was, um, she'd lived on this plot of concrete. It's really hard to see the, ca the cage, the dimensions, but that's literally the extent of her cage. Um, she was morbidly obese. She'd lived there for eight years. She came in as a cub with a um, sibling who had already dropped dead three years ago. Very, very young age for a bear. Um, so she obviously, she lived in Maryland. It's very hot there. And when this picture was taken, this is mostly what she does, <coughs> gasping for breath amidst her own feces. So this is a situation, I mentioned this particularly because um, this is a situation where we, we, we knew we needed to get this bear out of this. Re regardless of whether they cleaned up the feces, this is a not an adequate situation for this bear. Um, so how we went about doing that was uh, using a variety of um, avenues. One of those was the USDA. So we submitted formal, a formal USDA complaint along with my lawyers. We compiled it, um, made arguments for why this is a violation of the law, brought in experts from the outside to explain why this is inadequate for her health and welfare. And they went out routinely every couple of months and they were pressuring. So from the federal side, there was pressure. And then we went to the local law enforcement, the Frederick County um, Sheriff's Office and initiated an investigation with them, tipped them off to this and they that, that investigation is still ongoing almost a year later, unfortunately, but that's another form of level of pressure. And then that didn't work. Um, and of course, I had gotten on the phone before we did any of that. I had gotten on the phone with the owner and tried to just plea with him, beg him to release her and send her to sanctuary. I offered, we offered to completely pay for it, to fly him out there, to see it, every, everything we could, poss any possible angle we could get at, and he refused. So then we submitted an action alert out to our over six million members and supporters worldwide, asking them all to please call this man and politely ask him to remove this bear and put her in a sanctuary. That, he just disconnected his phone line. But it did work a little, I mean that was, so all of these levels of pressure and eventually after a couple of months he did cave, um, not to us but to our sanctuary partner. Um, I was able, we were still able to send a vet out during her rescue but, um, yeah, so they, they eventually did rescue her. And then with respect to the general husbandry situation for these bears, I mentioned bears in particular because this is an example of an extremely archaic husbandry practice that has been around since for decades, at least 30 or 40 years, probably more, um, of keeping bears in concrete pits. These are called bear pits. They still happen. Um, they're pretty common in North Carolina and Tennessee in particular. Um, there's a whole string of them out there, but they're, they're shockingly common. Um, and of course this is, you can't, you can tell this is the extent of the enclosure. There are a couple of dens under here, but there are actually two adult grizzly bears in this enclosure. One of them was inside. And um, they, are, they allow the public to go in there and throw food. Um, so that's their, these bears' primary food source is just bread and occasional uh, leaves of lettuce and occasional fruit. Um, and then they'll supplement that with some dog food if needed, um, depending upon how heavy the patron load has been that day. Um, so obviously we have, we have problems with inadequate diet and malnutrition. Um, think about what I, just, which, what I just explained about bears and who they are and what they need. Um, think about the sensory deprivation and the consequences of that psychologically of this kind of environment. Not only are they visually deprived, but think about the, their ability to use that nose and how blind they are in this type of, type of environment. Um, so mostly what they do is they, they beg. They literally stare directly into the sunlight all day looking for food to fall from the sky. Or they'll pace um, or you know, chew on things they're not supposed to, which of course has all of these um, implications for their health. This is a bear being fed, being supplemented dog food. This is not a pit, but that's a very common practice. Um, and this is an example in the bottom right of just how many, and this is actually, there are six bears in this enclosure. So there, there are two you can't see in this photograph, but um, bears are typically pretty solitary animals in the wild. So you can imagine the social tensions, the chronic frustration from being, from not having their own space and what that kind of psychological damage that causes. Um, concrete, living on concrete. This was something that we did 30 or 40 years ago because we thought it was going to be good for welfare because it's very easy to sanitize. Um, and at the time, it was all about keeping animals from dying, right? So you know, it, diseases were a big part of that. So if you can't sanitize the floor, then how are you gonna keep animals alive? Well, we learned after keeping bears in, on concrete for their entire lives, for multiple generations, that this actually wreaks havoc on their joints. 
um, and it causes early onset osteoarthritis, which is incredibly painful and often goes untreated in these facilities. Um, from especially exacerbated by the pacing that they do, this, is this neurosis that they develop, and the concrete and how hot that gets, they often get these dry, cracked paws, paw pads, and of course those can become infected and can be incredibly painful. Um, and then of course they sit there and they do things like this, uh, chewing on things they're not supposed to chew on, like um, the metal bars of the gates in their enclosure. And that leads to pretty severe dental trauma, which is incredibly common in these bears as well. You can see the bear on the left, his um, canine, pulp ca the pulp cavity is exposed because it's been crowned down so much. And that's living tissue. So if that gets infected, which they do, uh, it's not only incredibly painful, but it's actually directly connected to the systemic bloodstream and can go into other organ systems and can actually kill an animal, could be deadly. Um, this is an example I mentioned to you about um, how concrete wreaks havoc on these animals' joints. Um, I found this bear in Pennsylvania two years ago in a pit with another bear, um, and I, I didn't understand what this was at first. I didn't know if it was behavioral. It turns out she was walking on her elbows because she was in so much pain because she'd been living in this pit her entire life, um, and we don't know exactly how long that was, but without completely without medical care um, whatsoever. So. Um, I'll tell you all of this not to totally depress you because we are making really good progress and every time I find a case like that or we get to do a rescue, we educate a whole slew of the, the facility, from the facility to the local law enforcement to the federal regulators. Um, and in this case, I found this bear and we worked, we looked at the Animal Welfare Act um, and we, we picked out things that we felt would fall into this category of um, inadequacy. So there's th these useful things that I, that I mentioned to you that are incredibly generic and broad in terms of language um, can be used, interpreted to, for example, apply to this situation. So for space requirements, inadequate space may be indicated by evidence of malnutrition, poor condition, debility, stress, or abnormal behavioral patterns, right? So we submitted a USDA complaint um, citing this space requirement as something that we believe is inadequate here. In, in addition to that veterinary, lack of veterinary care, of course. Um, and this was a breakthrough. This was the first time ever that with the USDA has, they sent out an inspector and she happened to have worked at a facility that housed bears. She happened to have some bear background, so she knew something about bears. And then, you know, of course she had the ammunition that we provided with our complaint and citing experts in our complaint. And she went in there and she cited them for the first time ever for keeping bears on concrete. Um, so bears typically engage in postural behaviors of swimming, climbing, and digging. These bears have no ability to express these behaviors in this enclosure. This female is showing signs of debility consistent with being housed exclusively on concrete as evident by her painful movement and suspected early arthritic changes. So this was a huge, huge breakthrough for us. <laughs> you know, it doesn't sound like much probably, and the result doesn't look like much probably to the average person, but you have to think about from the animal's perspective, right? This animal has lived in a, literally a concrete box. She didn't even have, she couldn't even see the sky. Um, so she has lived in this concrete box for at least 10 years. Um, this is the first time that she's now had, and she, they're still connected to the same enclosure, but she's actually there. You can't really see her very well. Um, but she now has access to this, to this outdoor enclosure and she spends a lot of time there. As you can imagine, she can smell things, she can see things, she can have relief from the concrete on her joints. Um, one of the other angles that we take to try to change the law and advance the law according to most current science is submitting petitions for rulemaking to the USDA. This was submitted in 2012 and still has not been responded to despite the fact that we have sued them under the APA for failing to respond within a reasonable time frame. And they've also, um, they've, had, they've taken comment on this twice, um, one time with 15,000 comments. So um, they've done something, but they haven't responded formally and they haven't obviously enacted any bear specific regulations. But one of the things we really need them to do is start building in species specific regulations into the Animal Welfare Act guidelines so that we can provide for the individuals that they are. Um, and then of course we have situations where years and years go by and hundreds and hundreds of citations rack up and it's still business as usual and there's no movement and we've exhausted every other avenue and then we take um, sort of the more hard hitting um, 
avenues, including investigations and including lawsuits, which Don will talk to you about in a minute. Um, these two investigations, not only do they provide more uh, evidence for us and more evidence for the federal government trying to bring, um, bring legal protections forward for these animals, but it also helps us um, harness the public opinion to create pressure and change for these animals, and that's typically the most effective, shockingly. Um, and then some legal case studies, and I will let Don Bauer come up and talk for a minute about some of the work we've done together. Um, in this case, this is Alita and the Dade City's Wild Things, where you swim with tigers, and both of these cases are under the Endangered Species Act. Um, so we, there, there's a variety of things that we'll do with lawsuits, but um, Endangered Species Act has been a popular one recently. The industry has a vested interest in spinning these. That sells a lot of Shamu dolls, it sells a lot of tickets at the gate. There's no record of an orca doing any harm in the wild. So just hit it when you're ready, and then here. Okay, so real quick, uh, obviously as you can tell, there's a lot of legal issues that arise in, in this area. Um, and uh, I'll just mention that um, there's a magazine called Corporate Legal Counsel. It's a big deal magazine and law firms like mine every year compete very hard to be named Law Firm of the Year. Uh, and th this is a big deal where we invest all kinds of marketing efforts when you're with a law firm. The winner of the award this year was the legal staff for the PETA Foundation, which is a pretty amazing thing. <laughs> so, um, uh, I'm just going to highlight a few cases that I've been involved in, and this is a situation where, uh, these are situations where the Animal Welfare Act, the law that, that Heather has talked about principally, have not been adequate to address the job. And what we've done is we've reached out to look at conservation statutes, the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act, to see if they can apply to some of these captive settings to improve the circumstances within which these animals are, are kept. So I'm gonna show a few short videos. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about these cases, so it would take too long. Um, this will just give you a short glimpse of what the issues are, and I'll give you a quick summary about the case. So um, the first one I'm gonna show, this is just a clip from the trailer for the movie Blackfish. Many of you are probably familiar with that, which is the story of the orca whale Tilikum, who has been held in captivity in SeaWorld, uh, and prior to that, another facility for, for decades. Tilikum has a, had a very difficult history. He killed three people, um, and there's been a lot of, there were a lot of questions about why is that? What is it about Tilikum that has caused him to have these act interactions with humans? Um, Tilikum died in January of this year, and a, a strong effort has been underway to get SeaWorld to release his medical records, make them available to science so we can find out is there, was there something about him that caused him to behave this way uh, or was this just the result of, of the circumstances under which he was kept in captivity. So the industry has a vested interest in spinning these. That sells a lot of Shamu dolls, it sells a lot of tickets at the gate. There's no record of an orca doing any harm in the wild. Oh, it was, okay. Yeah. Um, so what we've done, under the Animal Welfare Act, SeaWorld is, is, has the authority to request the health records of any animal in captivity. See where uh, the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service in the Department of Agriculture never asks for those records. So what we did is we went back and we looked at the permit issued under the Marine Mammal Protection Act within which Tillich, under which Tillicum was originally imported into the United States in 1992. And there is a re requirement in that permit that SeaWorld make available the necropsy report after the death of the animal and his clinical history. Uh, we've called that issue to the attention of the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is the agency that administers the MMPA, and to this point, they have declined to recognize the applicability of that permit condition, arguing that this is really an issue for the Animal Welfare Act. So we've got two agencies potentially involved, neither one of which is exercising its authority to get these health records. Uh, the second case I'm gonna talk about involves Lolita, 
a orca that is in captivity in the Miami Sea Aquarium, uh, has been there for about 50 years. Um, and a case is now, has, is now underway under the Endangered Species Act to try to apply the take prohibition from the ESA to the conditions under which Lolita is now being held uh, at the Sea Aquarium. Lolita the killer whale remains in America's smallest orca tank. Since being captured in 1970, Lolita the orca whale has resided at the Miami Seaquarium in Florida. She's been forced to perform tricks for live shows since being stolen from her pod at age four. Not only that, but her tank happens to be the smallest orca tank in the U.S. Lolita is roughly 21 feet long and weighs 7,000 pounds. For a whale her size, Regulations state her tank should be at least 48 feet wide, with a straight line of travel across the middle. Her actual tank is just 35 feet wide by 80 feet across, with a concrete station in the center. Living in such tight quarters for 46 years has also led to psychological trauma, as Lolita can often be seen circling the tank and exhibiting other abnormal repetitive behaviors. The cramped tank also exposes Lolita to the sun's UV radiation which has led to terrible eyesight stemming from a pterygium. At 50 years old, Lolita is the oldest orca in captivity, and her mental and physical ailments are racking up. Animal welfare organization PETA has been working tirelessly to have the Miami Seaquarium held responsible for the whale's suffering due to the poor treatment she's given. But whether she'll ever be released back into her pod in the wild or a seaside sanctuary to retire remains a big question mark. So in this case, um, see, see a story that really should be animated? Suggest, suggest stories to Tomo News Now. Uh, um, the district court ruled against PETA in, the, in, uh, in that case and determined that the Endangered Species Act does not apply to animals in captivity. That case is now on appeal. Uh, there are some other cases around the country that have been fi filed to apply that theory that have been successful. The case has been on appeal now for an extended period of time, so it appears that the Court of Appeals is taking a very close look at it. Uh, this is a case that Pat Perino and I participated in as expert witnesses in an attorney's fee claim that was brought by the Sequarium against PETA after the district court argued to make the case that the take prohibition of the ESA does have applicability and it was not uh, uh, an outlandish case for PETA to bring. That was the argument the Sequarium was, was filing. Uh, the Sequarium has now withdrawn that attorney's fee motion after the PETA opposition and the expert testimony that we provided. Um, uh, another recent development in this case is that although the animal, uh, under the Animal Welfare Act, the Department of Agriculture has held this facility to be adequate a, a petition to the Inspector General at the Department of Agriculture just last week resulted in a report that said that the uh, Department of Agriculture may have been wrong in reaching that conclusion. So finally, um, yesterday, Jean-Michel Cousteau talked about establishing sanctuaries for orca whales, and he talked about the experience with Keiko, the whale from Free Willy. This is a short clip from when Keiko was transported from Oregon to Iceland and released into a sanctuary setting in Iceland.
There's now a project underway to identify sanctuary areas around the United States and Canada where the orcas that are now held in captivity can be moved and retired to live in the natural environment. Thank you, Don. Uh, I just want to end it on a positive note because this, I think, has been a pretty heavy talk. This is Fifi. She's my favorite bear on the planet. Um, we found her, gosh, last year. She was living in the backyard of her owner. It was a private owner situation. He had he had owned and operated a little backyard zoo about 25 years ago with, where she and two of her companions were circus animals. She was that bicycle riding bear that you see in historical circus and still sometimes today uh, circus performances. And she's lived ever since then on this plot of concrete for about the past 25 years with this um, dilapidated shelter and a ball. Um, and she was so wrecked in her spine from arthritis that it was nearly fused, so she didn't have much mobility in her hind legs. Um, she had all these sores on her back paws from dragging them, trying to walk around. But she was the spunkiest personality. You would, even in her current state of pain, she was <laughs> full of personality, very big personality. Um, so we knew she was gonna thrive pretty well. When we got her over to a sanctuary, we were able to rescue these two bears. We actually only found out about this, just a side note, that. Um, we found out about this because he had posted um, on Craigslist, he was giving away all of these like uh, caging materials, so the heavy like iron and um, kind of expensive stuff, but uh, the caveat was you had to take three bears with you for free. So this is an example of how bad our bear problem is in this country. Um, so we took her, we were happy to be that those people, and we took her to our uh, sanctuary in Colorado and she was there Less is, I think less than six months later, she had the, for the first time an opportunity to den properly and hibernate over, over a winter, and she came out um, looking like this. <laughs> so I, I just love this story because it just shows, goes to show you that miraculous transformations are possible when we let bears be bears and put the human agenda aside and just provide for them. Um, she is before, after. She's a living testament to that. I'm 32 years old, just amazing, um, which is very old for a bear, getting very old. And then I just wanna, I, always, I wanna end with this um, quote, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, because I think that this issue, although I feel so gratified by the work that I'm able to do for individual animals, I think this is a much bigger issue as well. If we cannot, this is so obvious, this is training wheels, guys. If we cannot solve this, what hope is there for us to be able to solve a variety of incredible humanitarian struggles that are going on in the world all over the place, provide for ourselves, provide for our planet. Um, suffer, I believe their suffering is intimately tied to ours. So um, I hope that you'll join us. Uh, that's it, the end. Absolutely. Okay. So, for those who don't have